Hello. My name is Sarah Lavender. A S M R. And tonight, 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 I thought that we could spend some time together. Having a glass of wine and reading a good book. I'll admit this is how I spend a lot of my evenings. Either with a glass of wine or a cup of tea. So, the wine that I have here with me The first is a Cabernet Sauvignon, which I am definitely not saying exactly right. I just call them Cab Savs. And it is a red wine, pretty full bodied. I'm not a big fan of sweet wines, so I tend to have really flavorful red wines. This wine is made here in Mexico in the Valle de Guadalupe in Baja, California. Let me tell you about it. I'll translate from Spanish. It says, the grape is originally from France, adapted to the ground of the Guadalupe Valley. It's a red wine with a ruby red color with aromas of mature red fruit and spices. It has a firm tannin tannin flavor, intense and equalizing. There's probably a better word for equili, equilibrado, but I'm not sure. The bottle has, I believe it's the Aztec calendar. But I definitely could be wrong. And it's by L. A. Seto. I really like this brand because they're really affordable. And they're also very good. It also very well could be pronounced L. A. Cheto but I'm not sure. The pronunciation was never my strong suit. This is a corked wine. And I actually haven't tried their Cab Sav, but I've tried their Tempranillo. really good. I have one more wine. From the same company. And this is a Petite Syrah. I imagine that it's similar to the Cab in that the grapes are from France. But this was also originating in Mexico, Baja, California. This is a really small, personal size bottle of wine. Which is perfect for just, you know, a cup and a half 
when it's just you having it. This one is a twist off. I know there are probably some wine snobs out there who think no good wine can come from a twist off bottle, but I disagree. I think I'm actually the opposite of a wine snob. So since it's just me, I'm going to be having the Petite Syrah, which I never have had, so let's see. was a waitress in high school, but not at a fancy restaurant, and so I never quite learned how to pour wine with that fancy turn at the end that prevents it from dripping. I'm going to smell it. I'll be trying to do a decent wine tasting, but like I said, I'm pretty far from being a wine snob. But I have a general idea on how to taste wine. First, let's look at it. You can look at it from multiple angles. making sure, you know, we want it to be kind of sparkly in the sense that it's not dull or too brown. We're looking at the colors, how dark the purple is, how much red is there. Holding it to the light. Looking down into it, and then just swirling it. This part I was never very good at. I feel like I'm going to spill it, but... And then looking at the legs that run down after you swirl it. it gives you an idea of how high the alcohol content is. Now we're going to smell it. Well, it smells very good. I definitely am getting fruit notes, but I believe that most wine should have the smell of fruit. Sometimes blueberry or cherry. I almost get kind of a green apple smell from this one. It's really not too sweet. You can also sometimes smell or taste what kind of barrel it's been aged in. So, let's try it. The correct way to sip your wine to kind of get the full flavor profile is to slurp it or take a drink as if you're sipping it through a straw that aerates the wine and gives you the full flavor profile. But for the sake of 
an ASMR video, I'm not going to slurp. <laughs> I'm just going to try it. I don't slurp it. That's the wrong word. I don't... I don't know. <laughs> I just drink it normally at home. So let's see. really good. It has a lot of flavors. I almost am getting a peppery taste. Maybe plum. It's not sweet at all, which I like. All right, let's set this here. So, the book that I'm going to read today is the Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver, which is one of my favorite books of all time. I did a video where I talked about my favorite books, and I included this one in there. Barbara Kingsolver is probably the author that I've read the most in terms of standalone novels. I've read The Bean Trees by her, Pigs in Heaven, Animal Dreams, and The Poisonwood Bible. By far, this one is my favorite. It took her 10 years to write. about a missionary family in the Congo, an American missionary family, and it's really interesting because Barbara spent a few years in the Congo as a child as well. Her parents were volunteering doctors there, which is, you know, what an incredible childhood takes place in, I believe, 1959 in Belgian Congo, which, if you are a history geek, you know what was going on in the Congo in the 50s and 60s. So it's actually a very political book has a lot to say about missionary work, about foreign influence in developing countries, about colonialism, I'm going to read you the back, okay? The Poisonwood Bible is a story told by the wife and four daughters of Nathan Price a fierce evangelical Baptist who takes his family and mission to the Belgian Congo in 1959. They carry with them everything they believe they will need from home, but soon find that all of it, from garden seeds to scripture, is calamitously transformed on African soil. What follows is a suspenseful epic of one family's tragic undoing and remarkable reconstruction over the course of three decades in post-colonial Africa. So I'm going to read a bit from the prologue.
I believe this book is now sometimes being taught in high school classes kind of working its way towards being a, a classic um, however in some schools it is a banned book mainly Christian private schools it's a banned book because it has both good and bad things to say about religion religion and missionary work it's pretty interesting because the author has a strong opinion on what a good missionary looks like and what a bad missionary looks like and in the book she presents both of them the good missionary who is fully integrated in the culture and you know the bad missionary who comes into a foreign country and tries to make the local people conform and doesn't take the time to understand them, their needs. The book has a lot to say about that. I have a friend who went to a private Christian all-girls school and she said because this book was banned, it just made her want to read it. Imagine a ruin so strange it must never have happened. First, picture the forest. I want you to be its conscience, the eyes in the trees. The trees are columns of slick, brindled bark like muscular animals overgrown beyond all reason. Every space is filled with life. Delicate, poisonous frogs, war-painted like skeletons, clutched in copulation, secreting their precious eggs onto dripping leaves. Vines strangling their own kin in the everlasting wrestle for sunlight. The breathing of monkeys. A glide of snake belly on a branch. A single file army of ants biting a mammoth tree into uniform grains and hauling it down to the dark for their ravenous queen. And in reply, a choir of seedlings arching their necks out of the rotted tree stumps, sucking life out of death. The forest eats itself and lives forever. So you can already tell, well, in my opinion, how good of a writer she is. I don't think I've read such good imagery probably have, but this is the most recent. Away down below now, single file on the path, comes a woman with four girls in tow, all of them in shirt waist dresses. Seen from above this way, they are pale, doomed blossoms, bound to appeal to your sympathies. Be careful. Later on, you'll have to decide what sympathy they deserve. The mother especially. Watch how she leads them on. Pale-eyed, deliberate. Her dark hair is tied in a ragged lace handkerchief, and her curved jawbone is lit with large, false pearl earrings, as if these headlamps from another world might show the way. The daughters march behind her. Four girls, compressed in bodies as tight as bowstrings, each one tends to fire off a woman's heart on, di on a different path to glory or damnation. Even now they resist affinity like cats in a bag. Two blondes, the one short and fierce, the other tall and imperious, flanked by matching 
by matched brunettes like bookends, the forward twin leading hungrily, while the rear one sweeps the ground in a rhythmic limp. It's actually pretty hard to read out loud for a long time. I don't know how people who narrate audiobooks do it. <laughs> But gamely enough, they climb together over logs of rank decay that have fallen across the path. Their mother, the mother, waves a graceful hand in front of her as she leads the way, parting curtain after curtain of spider's webs. She appears to be conducting a symphony. Behind them, the curtain closes. The spiders return to their killing ways. At the stream bank, she sets out their drear picnic, which is only dense, crumbling bread, daubed with crushed peanuts and slices of bitter plantain. After months of modest hunger, the children now forget to complain about food. Silently, they swallow, shake off the crumbs, and drift downstream for a swim in faster water. The mother is left alone in the cove of enormous trees at the edge of a pool. This place is as familiar to her now as a living room in the house of a life she never bargained for. She rests uneasily in the silence, watching ants boil darkly over the crumbs of what seemed to begin with an impossibly meager lunch. Always there is someone hungrier than her own children. She tucks her dress under her legs and inspects her poor, featherless feet in their grass nest at the water's edge. Twin birds helpless to fly out of there, away from the disaster she knows is coming. She could lose everything, herself or worse, her children. Worst of all, you, her only secret, her favorite. How could a mother live with herself to blame? She is inhumanely alone. And then, all at once, she isn't. A beautiful animal stands at the other side of the water. They look up from their lives, woman and animal, amazed to find themselves in the same place. You're supposed to hold a wine glass by the stem, but I'm always holding it by the, by the cup. The animal freezes, inspecting her with his black-tipped ears. His back is purplish-brown in the dim light, sloped downward from the gentle hump of his shoulders. The forest shadows fall into lines across his white striped flanks. His stiff forelegs splay out to the sides like stilts, for he's been caught in the act of reaching down for water. Without taking his eyes from her, he twitches a little at the knee, then at the shoulder, where a fly doubles him. Finally, he surrenders his surprise, looks away, and drinks. She can feel the touch of his long curled tongue on the water's skin, as if he were lapping from her hand. His head bobs gently, nodding small velvet horns lit white from behind like new leaves.
It lasted just a moment, whatever that is. One held breath, an ant's afternoon. It was brief, I can promise that much. For although it's been many years now since my children ruled my life, a mother recalls the measure of the silences. I never had more than five minutes peace unbroken. I was that woman on the stream bank, of course. Orleana Price, Southern Baptist by marriage, mother of children, living and dead. That one time, and no other, the Okapi came to the stream, and I was the only one to see it. Do you know what an Okapi is? It's as she described, sort of a deer-like animal with stripes on its legs. They're pretty rare. I think I only know what it is because I watched a lot of Animal Planet as a child. Books that take place in cultures that I'm not really that familiar with. I always loved them. Like The Good Earth by Pearl Buck. I believe that's the author. Which takes place in maybe, I don't know, I don't know what year, but in China, maybe a couple hundred years ago, a Chinese peasant. That's another book that I love. I knew nothing about Congolese culture until this book. It's fascinating, but also the situation described in this book after Belgian rule and during Belgian rule, colonialism is very sad. a pretty heavy book. It's very good. Um, if you are looking for something a bit lighter, The Bean Trees by her is also really interesting and not quite as intense. I should mention that this video is very heavily inspired, well, more or less, by one of my favorite ASMR videos of all time, which is ASMR and a Good Cigar, which I will try to link up here, down here, and it is a woman describing how to smoke a cigar and then she reads a book, and it's very old school and very relaxing. I am not a fan of cigars. I've never had one, actually. I'm not a fan of smoking, but hearing someone explain something they know a lot about and then reading a book is kind of my, my sweet spot for ASMR. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining me tonight. If you like this video, let me know and I will try to do more like it in the future. Maybe one talking about espresso. Because I'm one of those weird people who can have espresso at like 8 o'clock at night and still sleep. Okay. Until next time.